coming up on Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat. The evidence is around one person in five in the general population struggled significantly. See, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, more than they might cope with using their normal coping, some of which wasn't available. You know, if you had told me three years ago there would be a pandemic, they will close the schools, many, many businesses, uh, international travel and so forth, but that four out of five people would work through this without substantial problems, I would not have believed you. One of the big messages for me is about the fragility of the global system, but more than that, the resilience and strength that we somehow find in unthinkable difficulties. My name is Brendan Kelly. I'm a professor of psychiatry and author of In Search of Madness from Gill Books. This is my episode of Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat. Welcome to Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat with your hosts, David Clancy and Kieran Dunn. This is a podcast about high performance. What we are striving to achieve is to figure out what makes high performing individuals tick, why they do what they do and why they are successful. Enjoy a journey of stories, lessons, and learnings. Today we spoke with Professor Brendan Kelly, Professor of Psychiatry at Trinity College Dublin and Consultant Psychiatrist at Tala University Hospital. His research interests include the epidemiology of psychosis, mental health services, the history of psychiatry and human rights in mental health. He is most interested in the extent to which persons with mental illness participate in civic and social life and the barriers they and their families face in exercising their rights, including economic and social rights. Brendan contributes frequently to print and broadcast media and writes regularly for the medical press. He's the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Law and Psychiatry. There's a new book called In Search of Madness, a psychiatrist travels through the history of mental illness. Following the success of The Science of Happiness, The Six Principles of a Happy Life and The Seven Strategies for Achieving It reminds us of our chat with Dr. Tim Sharp, so number 132. Brendan compared psychology and psychiatry for us and where they complement each other in practice. We asked why Brendan took this career path and what it is about this profession that stimulates him. various types of babble. He discussed how psychiatry has evolved globally and in Ireland from the Shutter Island perception of lobotomies to new ways of treating people and how we're still learning about mental health, neuroscience and mental illness all the time. There are still so many questions to be answered. Professor Brendan Kelly, welcome to the show. We're, uh, we're both really looking forward to speaking with you today and, and learning from you. How are you? I'm good. Thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you. Brilliant. So we've been looking through your books, through your clinical work. I think you're in Tala Hospital at the moment. Is that where you are based? Yeah, I work at Tala University Hospital as a psychiatrist and a professor of psychiatry in Trinity in Dublin. Brilliant. Just getting an overview of the last maybe few months maybe getting back into a lot more of the natural landscape for people what has your time been like what does a normal week look like for you ah well i'm a psychiatrist which means i'm a medical doctor who has gone on to specialize in the treatment of mental illness and so i see people who have anxiety depression maybe bipolar disorder schizophrenia um see them in a clinic so they're at home, but also if they're admitted to hospital in the more severe stages, if you like, or during uh, times of crisis. So over the past couple of years, obviously working in a hospital and healthcare has been very different. Things went through all kinds of phases and changes and so forth, but things are normalizing quite a bit. You know, one of the interesting things about the pandemic for you know working in healthcare and hospitals is that we continued to work. So I have these incredible memories of driving to work on deserted deserted roads the only people you'd meet is the occasional squad car the guardy might pull you over uh, but the, it was like everyone had abandoned the planet until i got into work so that is all normalizing now but certainly i'll never forget that you know the deep lockdown um, and 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 just being out on an abandoned planet what have you taken from that extraordinary period that we've all lived through to your day-to-day clinical practice There was a lot of research about how we coped with the pandemic, you know, the virus, the illness, 
the restrictions, everyone given out about the restrictions and so forth. And all over the world, including Ireland, the evidence is around one person in five in the general population struggled significantly. So a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, more than they might cope with using their normal coping, some of which wasn't available. You know, so a lot of people who might cope by going to the gym and doing some sort of incredibly intense workout that wasn't available, at least not in the same way. But what, what I really took from it is that while one person in five in the general population in Ireland and elsewhere reported more significant anxiety or stress than they felt they could manage, four people out of five didn't. You know, if you had told me three years ago, there will be a pandemic, they will close the schools, many, many businesses, uh, international travel and so forth, but that four out of five people would work through this without substantial problems, I would not have believed you. So one of the big messages for me is about the fragility of the global system, but more than that, the resilience and strength that we somehow find in unthinkable difficulties. That is exactly what I was thinking as you were saying, one in five. What are the four people out of that five doing to preserve and maybe enhance that resilience during this time of adversity, but also new challenges that might be coming back, the reintegration into work, the reintegration into communities? What can we learn from those people and what do you think they're doing right? Yeah, that's a re really, really interesting question. And I, I really like your the, the uh, presumption in your question that it's about something they're doing. Because when you look at that one in five people in the population who, who, who struggled, that goes up to two out of five healthcare workers. So in a sense, uh, to a degree, it's not necessarily about what you're doing fully. Uh, some of it is to do with circumstances. You know, like, uh, for example, I was a healthcare worker before the pandemic. I, I didn't have any choice when the pandem pandemic came along. I'm still a healthcare worker. Put me in that increased risk for having stress or difficulty more than I could cope with normally. So some of it is to do with circumstance. And I think, you know, when you look at studies of happiness uh, and so forth, there's a lot of evidence now that around 50% of the variation in happiness between people is genetic, that we inherit a sort of a set point. And I think we know this, we all know happy people who, you know, don't really change that much from it. So, so some of this is, if you like, set, and some of it, and, and, and some of how we cope is to do with what we do, as you suggest. So what do the four and five people do uh, that help them get through this kind of thing better than other people? You know, there, there's a, in every country this is looked at, there is a gender difference here, which is that the burdens and the difficulties fell more on women than they did on men. Now, that's if we go with a binary gender division, which most of the research does. So we just, with that little caveat, we'll just stick with it though for the minute. So um, I suppose an awareness of that is important to do with the, the distribution of the difficulties and, and the burdens. But easily the biggest, the biggest protective factor in something like this is looking after physical and mental health. That's actively looking after both physical and mental health, pretty much as if they're the same thing. Would love to dive into burnout with you, Brendan, because we work in the corporate scene here a lot in Ireland and also in healthcare. And even to Kiran's point with the transition, the reintegration back and what is this new model of work? People are two days in the office, one day, three days. But we, we're hearing a lot of people that are suffering with, with burnout because they're doing lots of things. They're doing long extended hours, working from home. Boundaries are a bit all over the place, as it were. What are your thoughts to burnout and how can we get a better better handle of it yeah i mean there, there's a fundamental problem uh, with how many corporations see their employees uh, almost as if they're pieces on a chessboard and um, that can just uh, if you like be moved be moved around um, the evidence suggests that we don't function as individually as we might think so the example you gave there which is someone who might have what would we call it, blended or hybrid working or something. This presupposes that you as an individual, you're capable of managing your hours of work. You're capable of switching yourself on and off like a toaster just by flicking a switch and that you can manage all of this structure in your life yourself. Now, most of us can't. Most of us need to sign up to a structure. We need to sign up volu voluntarily, if you like. We need to sign up to arriving in at 9 a.m., 
going home at 5 p.m. And if we just stick with that structure without thinking about it and renegotiating it every day, we will be happier. It will give us a pattern. It will give us a rhythm. Now, it is voluntary. We could just throw it all in one day. But we tend to migrate towards rules, towards structures, you know, like children. We're all happier when there's a nice set of rules and we choose to obey them and we don't question them every day. So this is called into, called into question when we're working from home or we have blended working where we have to regulate all of that ourselves every day. We're just not up to it. Um, and we start, you know, working that little bit extra is the most common thing as opposed to working a little bit less. So we, we do need the structure and the rules. The other thing we need as humans is we need the social contact of work. This cannot be reproduced correctly uh, online. You know, there is no online substitute for glancing at someone during a meeting, sort of faintly but not fully throwing your eyes up to heaven so that two people at the meeting see it, but the other three don't. You see, when we're in person, we are capable of extraordinary subtlety. And we can interpret that subtlety as well, you know, and, you know, sending people emails or text messages during an online meeting, it doesn't even approach the level of subtlety we can achieve with eye contact, a slight motion of our heads. And we're extraordinary creatures when we're together. And, you know, it, our brains are so crazily complex that we react to the slightest facial expression in people we're in, we're in the room with. To the point where if you just, you know, if you took six people at a meeting, okay, and you did a little experiment, let's say an alien arrived, and all the alien could see were the brains, nothing else, and it saw these six brains suspended in midair, it would conclude they were a single organism. Hmm. So closely do we interact with each other, you know, with our billions of brain cells responding to the billions of brain cells of the person across the room, across the table, that we function as a single organism. And when we try and disembody work, treat people like pieces on a chessboard uh, or pieces in a jigsaw, we lose that, the extraordinary power that these settings bring and the satisfaction and the joy. That's excellent. And it goes back to, we were at a conference last week in London called the Water Cooler Event. And it was around well-being in the workplace. And a lot of the talks were focused around trying to just ask colleagues how you are and just ask it twice to try and get maybe something that they haven't shared the first time and get past the superficial answer that people deliver straight away. Do you think with hybrid working and blended working, and you're talking about the subtleties of human interaction, do you think there's a risk that our mental health and having that supportive platform of identifying someone who just seems off when you're in their presence, is that risk of being absent through online Zooms and us going forward? Are we putting ourselves and the employees and workers at more risk of issues because we're not just being in each other's presence? Yeah, I think we, we underestimate the value of presence enormously and the value of uh, physical interactions. So it might just be sitting with someone, uh, lingering after a meeting, giving someone opportunity to talk to you or not talk to you. And they might not talk to you, but they might nonetheless note that you lingered and gave them that opportunity. It's like We are very, very subtle, complicated people. I remember we did a paper once about when difficult events occur at work and where do you find support and help? And the difficult event that we were writing about was in my field, psychiatry, which is what happens when a, a, a patient or someone you're seeing uh, dies by suicide, which is a very, very difficult event you know, for everybody, for the person, their family, but also for the healthcare workers who might have been involved. And you know, the research is clear that formal support like counselling and so forth is important and needs to be there, but it doesn't hold a candle to your colleagues talking it over with you because we, we have this belief, and it's not untrue, that your colleagues, your immediate colleagues, are the only people who really understand the dilemma you were in, maybe the choices you faced and how you now feel. And it, is, it wasn't even the content of conversations that matters. It is the solidarity. It is the being there. It is the uh, buying someone a cup of coffee and discussing movies or the TV. It is not necessarily discussing the issue at hand, which often there might be nothing to be said about, but it's the hanging around. It's the water cooler, as you say. It's lingering, lingering in the car park before you drive off. These things which cannot be reproduced online 
remotely, virtually. We can do a lot online remotely and virtually and so forth, but you know, you can't hug someone. Hmm. For the people out there that aren't too aware of the differences between psychology and psychiatry, we'd love to learn a little bit more as to what distinguishes between those two worlds and why you went a little bit deeper into one of them. What was it about that one that really piqued your curiosity? So a psychiatrist like me, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who goes on to specialize in the treatment of mental illness in the way that, um, say, I once I graduated as a medical doctor, I could have gone on to, to be a surgeon, maybe, although I wouldn't have done that, uh, or an eye doctor, although I wouldn't have done that either. But instead, I went on to be a psychiatrist. So, so it's, it, it's a medical discipline, if you like. Now, a psychologist is not a medical doctor. That person does a psychology degree and then usually does some further training. So, so for example, they, uh, they don't prescribe medication. That, that's one difference. And they, they don't uh, look after inpatients in hospital. That, that's another difference. And they, a psychologist can go into a number of different areas. So a clinical psychologist would treat people with uh, mental illness or various psychological problems or mental health difficulties. And then you have educational psychologists Again, these aren't medical doctors. These are psychology graduates who go on to specialize in psychology as it pertains to, you know, teaching and learning and education at all levels. You have organizational psychologists and um, industrial psychologists. So th there's a lot of specialism in psychology. But as a psychiatrist, um, I, we do work with clinical psychologists. So they would very often be providing cognitive therapy for patients that I might be uh, I might or might not be prescribing medication for. Uh, they might a psychologist would also provide maybe behavioral therapy or different other other kinds of talk therapy uh, to complement uh, whatever else anyone might be doing. Um, we 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 don't always prescribe medication to everyone. Obviously, um, there is enormous demand uh, for medication, but um, you know it's not always appropriate or helpful. A lot of so, for example, for mild or moderate depression, a cognitive therapy is just as good as any medication if, if we can find the cognitive therapy, there's a shortage of therapists. So, so that's the difference. Now, you're, you asked why I went into psychiatry, um, and that's, that's a very good question. Um, why did you search for madness as playing on the book title as opposed to surgery or eyes? Indeed. Um, well, uh, so I, in secondary school, um, I decided I want to be, wanted to be either an economist or a psychiatrist. Now, these are radically different uh, in lots of ways, I guess. And my career guidance teacher uh, had, had great difficulty uh, advising me. About, <laughs> he was a very nice man, but I think I might have, might have caused him <laughs> some, some stress. But psychiatry interested me because mental illness say severe depression or bipolar disorder, which is manic depression and schizophrenia, it involves a great deal of suffering. And it, you know, it's, it's so compelling when you, when you see it. Uh, and many people and some people watching may suffer from these conditions, but there are often, there are such unanswered questions as well. We, we, we don't fully understand the biology of the human brain, to, to put it very mildly. Uh, we really don't. We have little bits of knowledge about it, but we don't fully understand it. And it's that uncertainty that attracted me, the, the vastness of the unanswered questions on the one hand, but also the undeniable suffering. You know, and it's so interesting. We don't really understand how the brain works, but we do have treatments that help people, be it cognitive therapy, be it antidepressant medication for some people. We know they work. We don't know why they work or particularly biologically why they're needed. So either this kind of uncertainty excites you and interests you or else you, you can't tolerate it, in which case you go off and you become an eye surgeon or something like that. But if you like the uncertainty uh, and the big unanswered questions, psychiatry is definitely for you. Excellent. And in your book, In Search of Madness, you mentioned our shift from psychobabble to neurobabble. And we've sort of seen that trend, but... Could you explain, maybe define both of them and, and tell us why we're shifting and moving towards this new neurobabble? Well, psychobabble, to begin with, uh, is the use of the language of psychology in ways that isn't justified. <clears throat> you know, to give you an example, 
you often hear, um, say, a, a country being described as depressed, like sort of Ireland is depressed because of the traumas that Ireland has suffered <laughs> in the past from which we have never recovered. Now, <laughs> well, you know, th this mixes up countries with people. I mean, I, I didn't live through the 1798 rebellion, and I don't think I have post-traumatic stress disorder from it. I don't think so. Psychobabble, you know, it's attractive, you know, to, to, to kind of use the language of psychology. But, you know, an awful lot of it is uh, just it's just rubbish. Um, so and in psychiatry, I suppose uh, there was a lot of that. I mean, a lot of very elaborate theorizing in psychological terms without much evidence to support it. And some of this was harmful. So elaborate psychological theories blaming certain family members for other family members being mentally ill, when in fact these were just attractive sounding theories with no basis. So we have to be really careful about that, mainly because the language of psychology is so seductive. We like to think we understand how we work. We like to think our inner lives make sense and you know they mightn't it could just a lot of it it's just random and um, so that's psychobabble so what's what's happened now is a reaction to that and we have a lot of uh, neuroscience going on some mm. of which has been really really helpful for some conditions uh, it has had very little impact in psychiatry mainly because um we, we get a lot of imaging studies a lot of uh, scan you know brain scans which produce really, really nice colored pictures. And, you know, any magazine article or website that has a nice colored picture of a brain scan, ideally with red bits and green bits, you know, everyone's going to think it's really, really cool. Whereas, in fact, the study might only be of 10 people and therefore essentially random. But the images and the idea of brain scanning and so on is as seductive as the language of psychology is. And our critical faculties we get suspended and we just get seduced by the pretty pictures. You know, we always have. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of neuroscience is oversold at the moment. There is some good work going on, but it's almost lost in a sea of tiny, unreliable research studies hyped through press releases um, and those amazing brain scan images, which mean absolutely nothing. We've seen Shutter Island. Well, I'm not sure if you have, have you? Yeah. And when I think of your world and lobotomies and all these sort of things, that's what comes to mind, right? I think of what happened in that movie. If you haven't seen Shutter Island, it's not for the faint hearted. Oh, but I'd like to nearly go into your the mental health services piece, especially here in Ireland. And again, to the book that you have coming out, you've got that change manifesto, that kind of piece as to how we can make it more effective and more accessible. And the word you say is just. What's that about? Because for the one in five, or maybe it's two in five, it's important that we get a handle of it. So what does that look like for you? So, you know, the history of psychiatry is, as you describe their lobotomies, Shutter Island kind of things. And it's, you know, th that history, which I chat about a good deal in the book, it still looms very large in everybody's minds. Not, you know, mm. one flew over the cuckoo's nest yeah. uh, kind of thing. Um, but things are, things are very different. If you take Ireland for an example here, in the 1960s, we had about 20,000 people in these big mental hospitals. And that has now dramatically changed. So today we have fewer than 2,000 people in um, inpatient psychiatric care. 90% of those are voluntary people. They're, they're not there against their wishes. They're there voluntarily for short stays. So our rate of involuntary admission or sectioning, which is the most severe condition, mm -hmm. is less than half the rate in England, for example. And our number of inpatients in psychiatry in Ireland is the third lowest in the EU per head of uh, population. So our mental health system has, the pendulum has swung dramatically mm -hmm. away from the custodial side of things to a non-custodial low numbers of inpatients. So this huge pendulum shift has happened to the point where the biggest complaint we have today is not that people are being kept in hospital against their wishes, but that people can't access care when they need it. it, it it's kind of turned into the complete opposite. So in terms of today's mental health services, there is a state mental health service here in Ireland. 
around 90% of people who attend it are treated as outpatients. So they might see a psychiatrist like me, maybe a psychologist, a social worker, a community nurse, and they're treated entirely at home and they don't come near a hospital at all. And of the 10% who get admitted, you know, nine out of 10 of those admissions are short term voluntary admissions. So it's a very, it's a very different system to your Shutter Island. Lobotomies are way off in the past. And um, so, so, so that's very different. The big issue, though, is to do with um, access to care, particularly for that one in five that we mentioned. These might be people who don't have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but are having pro some problems with depression or anxiety. And um, what they need is access to psychological care, mainly psychologists and counsellors. And for any, anyone listening who has a medical card, Ireland does have a counselling and primary care scheme for people on medical cards, but that needs to be radically expanded, particularly given the, uh, the needs, because that one person in five who had difficulty coping during the pandemic, like they're not really mentally ill. What they have is a largely understandable difficulty with an extraordinary circumstance. And very often that one, that one person in five who's struggling will have had a bereavement or might have lost their job, lost their financial security. And these aren't necessarily things for a psychiatrist like me. These don't need to be medicalized. You know, not everyone needs to see a doctor for things like this. People need psychological help from a psychologist or a counselor, lifestyle advice. And most people have a lot of resilience. Some need that extra little bit of structure from that kind of therapy. But, you know, it's about tapping into people's own strengths and own coping, which tends to be very, very good. So that, that, that's the big deficit in our services for that kind of one in five people who don't have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but still need that extra bit of support and help. Building into maybe suicide and suicide prevention, looking at the last maybe two decades, it's become more prevalent, maybe through probably our exposure to the numbers and, and increase in marketing around it and promotion, which is great. But what can we do? Does it need more resources? Does it need more promotion? What do we need to do in order to minimize the numbers and to get people to be more proactive when they need to seek help as opposed to being reactive and looking for it when it's too late? You know, this is very, very difficult. And I'm sure there's going to be people listening and watching who have been bereaved by suicide or who have contemplated self-harm or contemplated suicide at some point. And this is a, an issue of searing importance. Like, it, you know, it's touched pretty much every family in some way or other, friends, schools, and so forth. The public perception of this is interesting. Um, in the book, I talk a little bit about the statistics. So between 1996 and 2016, the number of suicides in the world fell by a third. So you've got this dramatic public health shift in a positive direction. Now, I used to describe this as the biggest public health shift of our lifetime, but then COVID came along and that was the biggest shift in public health. But it's still a fact that the decades leading up to 2016, 2017 demonstrated that it is possible to reduce rates of suicide dramatically. So while the statistics are really no consolation to anyone who is bereaved because suicide is always a personal tragedy and even one is too many. Uh, so I'm by no means saying the problem is solved or even close. Um, but the statistics demonstrate that change is possible. When you look at the pandemic, when you look at 2020, the year 2020 in the US, we're in the middle of COVID and the rate of suicide in the US fell by 6%. So the statistics don't always tell us what we expect. And the take home message is that positive change is possible. We need to do a whole lot more of it. And I'm I'm always interested in how we allocate public funds. Mm. Um, we tend to put funds into areas of services that are dysfunctional, okay, to try and fix them. But what if we pause for a minute and say, you know what, suicide fell in the world. Maybe what we're doing to reduce suicide is working. Now, there are probably other things like economic changes around the world and so forth, but maybe the enhanced suicide uh, prevention strategies are working. So let's double the funding for what works and do more of it. Many years ago, I was writing about this and I noted that in Ireland, there was, I think, more than 100 different groups being funded in different ways to address the issue of suicide. 
And I thought, well, that's inefficient. There needs to be one organization and let's make it efficient. But you know what? I think I was wrong, completely wrong. I think having a diversity of organizations reaches out to different people in different ways and they're approachable in different ways. But whatever it is, seems to be helping, uh, at least to a significant degree. So just to be absolutely clear, the problem of suicide and self-harm isn't solved by any means and improving statistics don't indicate the problem has gone away, but they indicate that we can make a difference. So yes, we do need to increase our suicide prevention work, more of the kind of thing that is being done and also a sort of a, a better general mental health service for those who struggle particularly. Building into what you were touching on before about challenge and, and curiosity in the profession that you obviously have leaned into, you know, we're thinking bipolar, schizophrenia, suicide, not easy probably being around um, people that are suffering to, to take your word with those sort of conditions. But you obviously love what you do because you're still doing it and you're publishing a lot of work and you're trying to get the message out there. So what is it about your work that you do love? What is it that you wake up every morning and, yeah, this is why I was born. This is what it's all about for me. Okay, well, you're crediting me with a great sense of mission the moment I wake up. <laughs> you have clearly, and I know you have not, ever been present the moment I wake up. <laughs> and I'm guessing never will be. <laughs> it's extensive but, research. <laughs> research okay, but you're not wrong. I actually wake up at six o'clock every morning full of beans and ready to go. Holidays, work days, everything. I'm up with the lark. Right. So um, I have always had an attraction to things that are nearly impossible to do, things that are really, really hard, things that I can't figure out how to do them. You know, one could have gone into an area of medicine with a defined skill set and just kind of got better and better and better at that and it's more and more specialized. But psychiatry is the opposite. You know, the questions become even more vast, like, um, who, you know, how do we decide who is mentally ill and who isn't? We don't have biological tests or scans or blood tests or things. So when does sadness shade into depression? You know, I know severe depression when I see it. I know regular sadness when I see it. But, you know, what about that big gray area in the middle? So what keeps me going are these big unanswered questions um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, the undeniable sort of suffering that I see and the fact that treatments help. They don't do the job fully, but they clearly relieve suffering to a good degree. And, you know, in the book, I talk about um, antipsychotic medication in schizophrenia. So this is pretty, you know, quite serious medication in psychiatry and it has side effects, um, but it, it, it helps in the short term. And I talk about some of the long-term studies that shows that someone with schizophrenia on this medication has half the risk of dying over the following 14 years. So mm. it treats the symptoms, but it also brings sort of a, a, some kind of coherence to their life. And that's even after you take account of their age or other illnesses or drug misuse and so forth. So that too keeps me going. The fact we don't really understand what causes these conditions, but somehow we have treatments that help substantially. You know, it's, it's, it's a very strange situation to be in, but the treatments do help. So yeah, so, so that's, that's what interests me. It's, it's very difficult and maybe impossible to do perfectly, but that's part of the attraction. And currently, so you've done a few projects recently, the Science of Happiness book back in 2021, I think, In Search of Madness, more recently. What are the unanswered questions or what are the impossible tasks that you're chasing at the moment? What's next for you? Well, there are so, there are just so many impossible tasks. We, we, <laughs> one, of, one of my big interests personally is to do with um, severe mental illness. So um, involuntary care, when someone is you know, so mentally ill that they cannot identify their own needs and uh, present a substantial risk to their own life and well-being and so forth. How do we, how do, we do that? Like, how do we treat that? How do we how do we manage that? How do we help people get through that? And how do we use things like the law and policy and so forth? I'm interested in the severe end of the spectrum. Now, I appreciate that people with, I don't know, say compulsive shopping disorder, if that's a thing, they suffer. I get that. But, you know, they can sort themselves out another way. I'm here at the other end of the spectrum. 
uh, with your severe schizophrenia, your treatment resistant depression, because as you might have gathered from the conversation so far, that's what interests me. It's the severe, the difficult, the unresolved. That's where I am. Everyone that comes on the show, we always finish with the same question. And here's a man that gets up early, filled with purpose, trying to answer the questions that you're not even sure. And you're kind of working in the gray a lot. And that's what's what's moving you forward, Brendan. Bearing all that in mind, what does high performance mean to you? Ah, well, that's a really good question, which probably I should have seen coming and yet didn't. <laughs> This raises severe questions about my performance, but um, <laughs> look, you know, what one of the principles uh, or one of the one of the ways I look at this is, you know, becoming absorbed in doing something, be it a piece of work. For me, it might be a piece of writing. It might be talking to a patient who's extremely disturbed, with, you know, basically no connection with reality, just trying to discuss things. So you get a teeny bit of overlap, a little bit of agreement doing that being in the zone being absorbed doing that is what it's all about i think a lot of people focus on outcomes they regard performance as a way to achieve outcomes and i think that can be very misleading i think that if you perform at a high enough level you get utterly absorbed in it the rest of the world disappears an hour goes past maybe it's two hours maybe it's three hours maybe you forget to eat maybe you forget to go home and um, when you're doing that, that's enough. You don't need to worry about outputs. Outputs will follow. Once you're in that zone, in that absorbed state with a task that is challenging, requires nearly all of your skills, but there is, there is, a, there is a meeting of that, that's enough. If we stay in that zone, the outputs, uh, the accomplishments, the achievements, they will follow but focusing on those seems like an error. So I'm at my happiest when I'm utterly absorbed in something, not focused on the outcome, just focused on the, the process of the task. Now, Bill Walsh once said the score takes care of itself. So Exactly. And, you know, and that, that's, where we, that's where we find happiness. That is where we're going to find, talk about, and I have, the science of happiness. But um, where we find happiness is in those moments when nothing else exists except me and the task and we we just merge. I, I'm going to ruin our flow here, Kieran. <laughs> and uh, Brendan, before we say Not thanks very much for joining the show, started a course yesterday with a fellow called Graham Fink, okay, who is a creative director. And he asked a question that stumped 84 of us on a Zoom call. I'm going to ask you now because I'm curious because of what you just said. What's the most important moment in your life? Now. You got it. You said no. He said, no, everyone, everyone on the call was saying when my baby was born, when you got married, when you transition into that job. But yeah, he emphasized, well, now is all we can concentrate and focus on. Don't. Look, there's only, there's only one moment. There, there are no other moments. We think about the past, we get depressed, think about the future, we get anxious, we, you know, and we only have moments to live. Professor Brendan Kelly, thanks very much for joining us today. We, we learned a lot from you, got a lot from it. Grateful for your time. And wishing you all the very best. Thanks a lot.